Well, you know, we're in this series about David in 3D, and the reason why we came up with that title, David in 3D, is because David is a great example of someone who followed God, and yet he was a wreck at the same time. How many of you follow God, and you're also a wreck? Isn't that great? And God can work in those circumstances. And I think it's really good to know that, that in, in the religious sense of the word saint, none of us are called to be that. None of us can be perfect. None of us can do everything right. But all of us can be forgiven and healed and delivered. And David is a great example of that because he adored God, as we're going to talk a little about today. Uh, he was so passionate about God, and yet in the midst of all the things that he was struggling with, he blew it royally. He blew it royally. But what he did after he blew it was so important. It was motivated by his love of God in repentance as well. So that's why we have this series, and today we're talking specifically about Finishing well, building God's kingdom. That's what David did. He did it big time. It was a lavish experience for him. And it's something that we can learn from. He is a great example to us. And so we want to learn these things. Today we're talking about how David finished his life building God's kingdom. What a great concept. Because it's so easy to get distracted, isn't it? Throughout our days, throughout our years, day in and day out, even Sunday after Sunday, it's easy to kind of forget, why are we doing all this? Isn't that right? Yeah. But, but David did not forget. He remembered, and his remembering is something that could change our lives and we can learn from big time. You know, he's such a radical departure from Saul, his predecessor, you know, Saul was separated from God towards the end of his life. He started off pretty cool. He started off seeking God. But throughout his life, he got distracted. Uh, he got discouraged. He, he started looking at things that were not important instead of the important things. And, and he really was troubled. He was troubled by depression, tormented by spirits because of jealousy and forgiveness and bitterness. In the end, he committed suicide along with his sons that died in battle. So we have, this, we have this great disparity between two kings. The first king who started off well and did not finish well. And the second king who finished well. And so we want to look at his example and see what we can learn. You know, as you get older and as you think about finishing well, you know, I'm, I'm almost 60 and I'm thinking about, well, I want to finish well, you know? And uh, I know none of you think I look 60, right? <laughs> no. No, but David was 70 when he died. And we're going to be talking about his, his actions. But when you're old, when you're old, you know, you have a different perspective on things. This is what George Burns said. He said, when I was a boy, the Dead Sea was only sick. Andy Rooney said this, see, if you know these names, you're old, right? <laughs> Andy Rooney said, I've learned that life is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer it gets to the end, the faster it goes. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that right? Yeah. What a bummer. What's up with the toilet paper? <laughs> Bob Hope said, he's another oldie. How many, how many young people know Bob Hope? You're not young. <laughs> Bob Hope said this, you know you're getting old when the candles cost more than the cake. <laughs> There's this, this fun story about two friends, right? And they, they went through their lives together. They had so much fun. They did lots of things together. And they were uh, sitting down for a card game. And they're playing cards, playing cards. And, and finally, one person, one of the friends looks up to the other and said, I'm sorry, but I know we've been friends for a long time, but what was your name? And the other one looked with astonishment at the one who just asked what, what his name was. And he looked with astonishment for several minutes. And then he looked up and said, how soon do you need to know? <laughs> That's my comedy routine. Ta -da -da. Uh, now, 
if you're young, you might be saying, well, this ain't for me at all. And I'm telling you right now, finishing well, building God's kingdom, you need to hear this when you're young. Young people, you need to hear this when you're young because God has something great for you. You know, as an old person, I can consider myself an old person, you know, it's, it's interesting what you pay attention to. Like when I turned 50, it was really interesting to see that all the billboards on I-15 talked about colonoscopies. I mean, I was paying attention to that. I had no idea that I needed one, but every billboard, it seemed, talked about it, right? I don't know why I said that. <laughs> when, you're, when, you're, when you want to finish well, it does not happen by accident. Doesn't that make sense? I mean, there's so many things to derail us in this life. When you want to finish well, it does not happen by accident. It depends on the decisions that you make earlier in your life. Practically speaking, like in retirement, it depends on money and health. And man, I abused my body for years and I see it. You know, that's why when I tell my doctor or, or, or some health professional that I have eight stents in my heart, they look at me like, wow, you're still standing? It's amazing. I abused my body over years, and so finishing well with this body, I'm doing my best now. I exercise a lot, and I, I definitely don't do a lot of the things that, that caused my heart harm and, and uh, my body harm, but uh, if you want to finish well, you have to choose to do the things that are going to help you to finish well. That's what we're talking about today. That's what David was all about. You know, uh, Robert Clinton is an author, and he, he, did a, he did a great study of 1,500 leaders, Christian leaders in, in the church. And what he found out was only one-third of Christian leaders, according to his definition, finished well. One-third. As a Christian leader, that concerns me. As a Christian leader, that concerns me about the rest of the body of Christ, not just leaders. Forget about leaders. How about all of us, Right? Only one-third finished well? I want to finish well. How many of you want to finish well? You want to see God glorified in your life in that very second, that very moment of when you go to be with Jesus and the first words out of his mouth are, well done, good and faithful servant. I had a wonderful chance to... Rob Lindley and, and, and Tracy Lindley... Uh, People in our church, that his, his mom was 93. She went to be with the Lord a week and a half ago. And, you know, I, I talked with her ahead of time. And uh, I said, are you anxious about anything? Because she knew that she was getting close to the end. And, uh, and she said, yes. And I said, oh, really, what? And she said, I'm anxious to see Jesus. And I, I was literally blown away by that. I thought, that is the way I want to end my life. I am anxious to see Jesus. I'm not anxious about the stupid things I've done. I'm not anxious about the, the poor investments spiritually, emotionally, physically that I've made in my life. I am anxious to see Jesus Christ. What a wonderful thing that is. And so we want to finish well. Finishing well does not mean becoming perfect. Otherwise, no one would finish well, right? It means that we're still growing in our passion, intimacy, and love for God. It means that we're still daily looking to reach people with the gospel. It means that we're sacrificially loving people. It means that we're passionately waiting to do His will each and every day. That's what finishing well is all about. So today we're going to look at some scriptures of, of, of David and his life and some of the things that he did towards the end of his life. In one of the scriptures today, we're going to see that 
If you read just a little further, we're not going to read this today, but if you just look a little further in in 1 Chronicles 29, at the end, David dies. He dies at 70. So David is at the end of his life in all of the context of what we're talking about right now. He had been king. He had been successful. He fought these great wars. God was on the throne. He was on the throne, and he was at the end of his life. And he is a great example of finishing well. Instead of taking it easy because he could retire from this job and and set up his son, he kicked butt. And that's what we want to do, right? That's what we want to do. So let's look at this scripture. This first one is in 2 Samuel. After the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest, From all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Here's the picture. The picture is is that David had built this great structure for himself out of cedar wood, which is the the preferred uh, uh, material for, for building. It had a great smell. It, it preserved well. Uh, it, it resisted bugs and, and rot and all these things. Uh, it was a very highly prized material, and he built this beautiful castle for himself out of wood. And then he thought to himself towards the end of his life, the ark of God remains in a tent. That speaks a lot about our lives sometimes, about our priorities, where we place them. And so he sees, hey, there's something I really want to do here. The ark of God, that that represents the very presence of God, right? Right. It it represents the, the, the very mercy seat of God, which is in the ark of God, on the ark of God, was the mercy seat where the blood sacrifice would be placed for forgiveness of sins. So here is this great ark. It represents God's love, God's passion, God's presence. And David says, this cannot be. This cannot be. The ark of God cannot live in a tent, of which it lived in for hundreds and hundreds of years. Then Nathan replied to the king, whatever you have in your mind, go and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night, The word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build a house for me to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of the rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over all the people of Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I've appointed leaders over my people Israel. I also give you rest from all your enemies. And here's one of the climactic moments of this whole thing. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. For you. David had peace for the first time in his warrior tendency as king in Israel. He had a great house of cedar, this beautiful house. And here is what's going on. You're going to have to imagine it, all right? Here's David saying, God, you've done amazing things for me. I love you so much. And the ministry that I've had has been amazing. My life has been amazing. And I want to provide for you this great house for the Ark of the Covenant with the Ten Commandments that are in it and this great place that we can worship you in. And God looks to David And said, 
I love you so much, David, that I am going to provide a house for you. For you. For you. It reminds me of my, my wonderful, sweet daughter, Hannah. When we text her, and she's up at school in Logan, when we text her, when we talk, I tell her how much I love her. And she looks back at me and she says, I love you more, Daddy. I love you more, Daddy. That's this relationship. That's what it is to walk with God. It's like, it's like we're tripping over each other to, to tell each other how much we love each other. That's what it is to follow God. That's how it is to finish well. This first point is building God's kingdom with passionate desire. With passionate desire. You can see this intimacy. God say, said, you may want to build me a house, but I want to build you an eternal house. I love you more. I love you more. That's exactly what happens in our worship environment on Sunday mornings. And hopefully you're doing this throughout the week, that you're worshiping the Lord. I love you, Lord. And you hear back from him, I love you more. I love you more. This is the beginning of finishing well, when you know that God loves you more. He loves you more. You know, there's, a, there's several practical expressions of this in our church. And I just want to give you one example of that. One example is a couple, which I'm, I'm not going to name, who came to Christ uh, several years ago now. But it, it, was, it was a great moment in their lives. It was, it was something that, that truly changed them forever and changed their family forever. And one day, they came in, and, 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 and they're a quilter, and, and, and they came in with this quilt, this gorgeous quilt. You could actually see it in, in the room behind the, the sound booth, if you wanted to look at it. This beautiful quilt, an expression of love. And it's named Born Again. That's, that's what this love looks like. That someone would spend tens of hours of hours putting together this great expression of love and calling it born again. As a matter of fact, there's a, a little card in the back which you could pull out and you can read, which is the story of it. That's what happens when God's love does something wonderful for you, isn't it? Isn't it? So it's kind of interesting because Solomon was David's son. He's not even the first son. He was put in charge to be king by God, and he is the one who was going to build a temple. And the reason why was because David was a man of war, and he wanted a peace. God wanted a, God, a, a man of peace to build the, this great temple. And in, in 2 Samuel 7, it says this, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, David is comfortable. He's in this, this cedar castle. I can imagine how wonderful that must have been. Yeah, once you see what some of the resources that are at David's disposal, you'll see that, that this must have been quite, quite the place. But he hears from God, okay, thank you so much. And because of your offer to build and because of your love for me, I'm going to establish your son to build this. And, and it, not only that, but your family is going to be the family that the Messiah comes from. That's what is being said here. And there are several prophecies. I think it's going to be talked about later in the series in more detail. But because of David's heart, because of God's love for David in loving him more, the Messiah, Christ, is going to come from David's family. And so the kingdom is going to be established forever. His reign will be established forever. So 
David could have said at this point, he's 70. He could have said, that's it. I'm just going to retire then. I, you know, that was the last thing on my bucket list, and, and I'm just going to retire now. But he didn't do that. He couldn't resist loving God more, loving God more. And his passion would not let him stop. In Acts 13, it says this, after removing Saul, he made David their king. God made David their king. And God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. Wow. That's what it's all about. That's, that's what this wonderful passion is all about. David, for decades, has been thinking that is what I want to do is please God. I am a man. I want to be a man after God's heart. Whatever it takes, that's what I want to do. How about you? I want to do that. God delights over it. There is nothing more wonderful than seeing his children. Don't you think, just with your earthly children, that there's nothing more wonderful than seeing them just in love with you? and enjoying your presence, enjoying what you do, enjoying being together, that is it, as far as I'm concerned. There's nothing more wonderful than that. And seeing your kids succeed in, 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 that, in, in that wonderful relationship between you and them. And it's the same way with God, but even more so. That's what God desires for us, is that we would be men and women after his own heart. When you're in love, you do crazy things. Yes? If you've been in love, you know that you do crazy things. Things that you wouldn't do normally in a regular day-to-day -day life. You bring little presents. You leave little notes. Yes? I remember taking, uh, taking a, a writer and writing on, on, on the mirror in our bathroom uh, about my love for my wife. A crazy thing. I, I mean, I would never do that normally. But I was thinking about her, and I thought, I just love this woman. She is so incredible. I delight in who she is. And I just want to write about how much I love her. Somewhere where she would never expect it. You do crazy things when you're in love. When you interact with the love of God, it becomes an irresistible response. I'm not talking about just saying, Jesus loves me, this I know, and knowing it in your head. I'm talking about the love that practically speaks to you. I love you more. I love you more. And because of that, it's an irresistible response on our part. We must say something. We must do something. We must act in some way. Love demands action like that. I call this the great why. Why do you do things in your life? Do you do it because you've always done it? Do you come to church because Sunday is when you go to church? Or do you come to church because God loves you more? Why do you come? Why do you read your Bible? Because somebody told you you should read your Bible so you're a, a good person? Or do you read it because you want to experience God's love in a deeper way? Why do you do what you do each day? Why do you wake up in the morning? Is it because you want to love God today? Or is it because you have to and the alarm went off? I've done that. Honestly, I've done that. Have you? That's why I've woken up many times in my life. But I don't want to do that anymore. I want to wake up because there is nothing more important to me than to be someone who delights in God and love his heart. So what did David do? What did David do? He did several things, and I'm going to kind of go through these kind of quickly. I just want you to see what David did because of his passion, because of his love. And some of these things have to do with resources. And I just want to just say here and now, this is not a giving sermon. This is a living sermon. 
This is not trying to make you feel guilty, like you should give this or you should give that. That's totally up to you in your love response to God. What I'm hoping is, is that we would be in love with God like this and finish well because we are passionately falling over heads over heels in love with our God who has given us everything, everything. Building God's kingdom, providing the land. So this is the story, just to set this up. David did something stupid. Aren't you glad that great men of God do stupid things, and it's okay, God's going to forgive, and also there's going to be a restoration of relationship. So David did something stupid in this story. He, he started counting his armies. Why would he do that? pride. He did it out of pride. He did it out of arrogance. He did that out of complacency. He just wanted to know, okay, so we have this big of army. I can sit back and relax now. He did that in the midst of me saying that he was passionately in love with God. He did the stupid thing. And that's a good thing to know. That's a 3D thing to know about David. That you can fail, but you can get up again because of the grace of God, because of the, oh, the cross moved, because of the cross of God. We can get up again and be restored back into relationship. And so he counted the, the armies, and God was very displeased and very sad about this whole thing. And, and so the punishment, David had a choice. It's kind of like, let's make a deal. Under, under um, curtain one was, um, uh, I just forgot what three years was. Three years was... Um, was um, Famine, three years of famine, that's right. Three years of famine on curtain one. Curtain number two was three months of being whooped by the enemy. Or the curtain number one was, was three days of, um, of plague. And, and so David said, I want to be in God's hands, not in the hands of, of man. And so I choose the three days of plague. And so the plague started, and after a, a couple days, going into the third day, David said, I must sacrifice to God and, and, and allow God's forgiveness to come in this situation. And so he was looking for a place to sacrifice, and he, he found this, uh, this land, and, and he said, I need to buy this so I can sacrifice on it. And, and, and the guy who owned the land said, oh, King David, just use it. Go ahead. I'll give it to you for free. And, and this is what David said. No, I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen and paid 50 shekels of silver for them. Loving God is a sacrificial thing sometimes. Jesus, God gave his very best to us. He gave us Christ, his son. He withheld nothing from us according to what the scripture said. It was a costly gift. And so worship is costly. Even, even our worship here on Sundays is costly. If it's a casual experience for you, I encourage you to think about the fact that the cost of being able to worship was Jesus Christ on the cross. And start worshiping with that understanding, at that value level. Start worshiping at that level. And so this is, what, this is what David did. He paid for it. He insisted on paying for it. And this becomes the land for the temple. Isn't that awesome? This land where this sacrifice took place is Mount Moriah, where the temple is. 1 Chronicles 22.1 says, David said, the house of the Lord God is to be here and also the altar of burnt offering for Israel. On this place where he paid, where he paid a price to be able to sacrifice and worship God and ask for forgiveness. He gave the land. He gave the land. Why would you hesitate? Here's God. Here's this... This, this one that, that you love, that, have, that has taken you your whole life. And, and what's that song, Do It Again? He did it every day. He did it in David's life. He supported David all throughout his life. Would he not want to give this land for the temple? Yes? The next one is building God's kingdom. 
giving resources. He provided a large amount of iron to make nails for the doors and the gateways and for the fittings and more bronze that could be weighed. David gave this. He gave all kinds of resources for the building of the temple. You see, he could have just said, Solomon will take care of this. I'm relaxing. I'm 70. 70 back then was the new 90, right? I mean, he was old, right? And, and, and he could have just said that, but he didn't want to. He wanted to bring whatever he could to the table. And so he brought this. We have, we have, we have great people in our church. We have, we have people that are generous, people that are passionate. And, and, and there's this one couple in our church that um, God has really blessed them. And what they do is... Every quarter, they, they decide, I'm going to give something special to God because of the blessing that I've received in my life. And so every quarter, they, they give something special, and they usually give it towards a, a special project. What a passionate way to live. So opposite the way of this world, wouldn't you say? Yes? Yeah. Next one is building God's kingdom with preparations. David said, my son Solomon is young and inexperienced, and the house to be built for the Lord should be great, of great magnificence and fame and splendor in the sight of the nations. Therefore, I will make preparations for it. So David made extensive preparations before his death. David was 70. He knew that this was a big project, and so he began mentoring his son. Those of you that are young, if you want to finish well, get a mentor. Those of you that are old, if you're not mentoring, it's very possible you're missing out on one of the great opportunities of having walked through your life. I encourage you to mentor someone. Find out someone who you're a little ahead of and spend time with them. Help them uh, not, not just with plans for their life, but what you've learned, that's what mentoring is all about. It's the things that God has invested in you, the things that God has told you, you tell to them. That's all it is, very simple. Anybody have something cool that God's told you and you've learned in your life? No? Nobody? Okay, we better start over. <laughs> you, of course you have. You, everyone has something to offer to someone else. And I would encourage you that you would not just focus on what you're focused on right now in the day-to-day -day, trying to stay afloat, but make sure you're investing in someone younger than you, whether it's spiritually younger or physically younger or whatever, in helping them and supporting them to be able to them finish well as well. Yes? Next one is building God's kingdom by making the call. Then he called for his son Solomon and charged him to build a house for the Lord, the God of Israel. This has to do with the mentoring process too. I've had the great privilege of mentoring several people in my time here. And one of my favorites, they're all favorites, but it, it's neat to see what God has done is Kevin in the Philippines to see that, you know, these 11 or 12 churches that he started. And I think, well, he has definitely eclipsed me in what I've done in my life. But I've been able to invest in him. What an incredible privilege that is. Yes. Call people. He'll tell you this story. I felt like the Lord was saying I need to talk with him. And, and honestly, he would, he would be okay with me saying this. He was a mess when, when I started talking to him. He really was. He was struggling so much in his life, trying to figure everything out. And, and I, I invited him out for pizza because I figured that's the inspired food and it'd probably be the, the best thing to do. And we went out for pizza. And I said, you know what? Let's spend some time together. And I, I'm not saying I, I had anything to do with what God's doing in his life now. I just know I had the privilege of investing in him. Call people. Who do you know in your life that needs to be called and said, you know what? God has a plan for your life and you don't want to miss that. Do you know somebody like that? Yes? You guys got awful quiet all of a sudden. I don't know what happened. You were talking it up a storm. Do I need to tell one of those old jokes again? Make the call in people's lives. Building God's kingdom with valuable supplies. I've taken great 
pains, David said, to provide for the temple of the Lord 100,000 talents of gold, a million talents of silver, quantities of bronze too great to be weighed. In our currency today, uh, um, 100,000 talents of gold would be $150 billion. Anybody have that? If you do, I need to talk to you after church. <laughs> he, it was a lavish gift. Now, everybody's lavish gift is different. Look at, the, look at the widow's might. That was a lavish gift. We're not talking. This is not a sermon on giving. This is a sermon on living. Living lavishly for God. So don't think I'm trying to get you to do something. Except for the fact, connect with God's passion, God's love for you, and allow that love to drive you to the very end of your life when you can say, I am anxious to see Jesus Christ. That's what this is about, you guys. Building God's kingdom and developing plans. He gave him the plans of all that the Spirit had put in his mind for the courts of the temple, of the Lord in all the surrounding rooms. Gave him the plans. David, David was praying, how should this be, Lord? What should we do? And he, he came up with that. You know, Paul, Paul said that he, he was struggling with, with, uh, uh, with uh, a church until God was, was birthed in their souls. That's what God wants to do for us, for others. You know, you're not going to be around that much longer, right? I mean, no matter how old you are, you're not going to be around that, that long. But you can put into place things that are going to have eternal results. Why not? Why not? Every one of us has great gifts that God has invested in us, just like David. And we can take and develop plans and allow them to be used by the next generation. Next generation, some of you are here. Take these plans and do it. Take these plans and do it. Building God's kingdom and offering encouragement. David also said to Solomon and his son, Be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Let's encourage people. Let's encourage. Let's give them courage. Let's support them in what they're doing. That's a great way to finish well. That's what David did to finish well. He was 70 years old. He could have just sat there, you know, gone into his, his little multimedia room and, and, and watched, you know, whatever he wanted to watch and, and casually gone on cruises. I love cruises, so that's a good way to go. Uh, but he could have done all these things just entertained people from, from all over the world and just had fun. But instead, he was encouraging the young, encouraging others. That's a way to finish well, building the kingdom. Amen? Are you building the kingdom today? Are you? Choose to build the kingdom. There is nothing better than finishing well, and finishing well is building the kingdom. It's not building your own kingdom. It's building the kingdom of God to see his kingdom come and his will be done in those around you and those for generations to come. And building God's kingdom is modeling praise. Modeling praise. That we would praise the Lord, that we would make a, a, a great effort for those around us to know that it's, it's not me that did anything. It's God. It's God himself. God provided the finances. God provided the wisdom. God provided the time. God provided my very breath. God alone. And we praise him. When you put praise and you give praise to God, it focuses on what's necessary and what's important. Why do people not finish well? First reason is distraction. You know, there's a lot going on in this world. There's a lot to be distracted by. There's the news, there's money, there's relationships, there's all kinds of things to be distracted by. Your work, your worries, your hopes, your dreams. There's all kinds of things to be distracted on. 
Are you distracted in your walk with God? I want to encourage you, finish well, build God's kingdom. Don't be distracted from being a child of God, following God. The disillusionment. Oh, I want to give you an example of, of distraction. A good di- example of that are, are the story of the ten virgin, the virgins, not versions. <laughs> the ten virgins. They, uh, five of them were waiting and focused and you know, they were, they were just waiting for God. And, and five of them were doing their own thing, and they missed the whole event of God coming into their lives. Don't be like those five virgins. Be like the first five, waiting, attentive, doing what God has for you. Disillusionment. Jonah is a disillusioned example for us. Are you disillusioned? Jonah, he... He, he, he looked at, he had must have seen, you know, he was supposed to go and tell this, tell this whole town, you know, you're going to blow it, and, and, and God's going to judge you. He must have seen uh, in, in his earlier ministry that sometimes people repent, and then he's kind of looked like holding the bag, like, well, how come you told us this, but this happened? And, and he, I'm not going to put myself out like that. I'm disillusioned with, with how this thing is working. Do you not put yourself out to believe God and get out of the boat because you're disillusioned? Don't be disillusioned. The next is plateauing. Solomon, the the one who built this temple, plateaued. He had built the temple. I mean, it was glorious. He had all this wisdom, according to the Proverbs. And, I mean, he had... People from all over the world coming to see him because how amazing he was. And then he was up there and he was thinking, wow, I'm pretty cool. I'm pretty cool. I could probably rest on my laurels. I'm okay. I'm a good Christian. I'm a good Christian. I could rest here. We can never rest. We can never rest because the call of God to go into the world to make disciples is not finished. And so we can never rest. When you rest... When you plateau like that, when you stop growing, what happens? You start dying. You start dying. Burnout. Moses was an example of burnout. He, he, was, he was judging all the people at, at one point in, in this trip throughout the, the, uh, the desert, and he was exhausted, and his father-in-law said, What are you doing? What are you doing? You need to get people to help you. Burnout can stop you right there. Don't let burnout happen because you're looking for the long haul, right? Burnout is someone trying to run a sprint when you're in a marathon. Don't burn out. Take your time. Trust the Lord in the things that he's calling you to do. Not living a compelling love experience. A life of religion will not let you finish well. It just won't. It has to be a life of passionate, passionate love for God. Paul said, Christ's love compels me. Compels me. What compels you when you wake up in the morning? If it's not the love of God, I want to know what it is. There's only one thing that can compel you in your life, and that is the love of God. It is the only thing that you will finish well with, is if you are being compelled, the great why. Why do you do what you do? It's because of this incredible thing. I love you more. I love you more. What will help you finish well? Let's have the worship team come on up. We're going to finish with a song. First of all, decide well. Know the great why. Know the great why. Why do you do what you do? You can't do it just because you did it yesterday. You have to do it because of the great reason of the love of God. Decide to be a person after God's own heart. Have that audience of one in your life. Love God. Love God. Have him be your audience and your audience alone. Decide to find someone who's an example, a mentor. 
And there's lots of great mentors here at the adventure. Hebrews uh, 13 says this, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so what, what the principles of finishing well today were the same principles that they were yesterday and yesterday and yesterday, going back to David's time and even before. So find a mentor. And then decide to let perseverance have its way. James 1.4 says, Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Let perseverance have its way. Yes, it's very easy to give up along the road. You know, there were two brothers. One said yes to God and eventually got distracted from the world, by the world, and stopped doing what God asked them to do. The other one actually said no, but throughout the process changed his mind and said yes. And Jesus asked, which one did his father's will? Which one? The one who finished, the one who finished well, building the kingdom of God.